Amen. So we're going to do a little bit differently uh, tonight. We're going to start with the preaching. And uh, I know several had to stay home and they tune into the live stream. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to do the best I can. But if we get cut off in 20, 30 minutes, uh, sorry about that. But you can tune in later. The whole, the whole sermon will be posted online if you want to uh, finish that. We're talking about the, the Lordship Salvation. And uh, we already discussed the first, time, uh, the first message I preached in this series was the, uh, uh, the hypocrisy of the Lordship Salvation crowd. And, and if you think about that, you know, the things that they say, is, number one is they say that the Lord has to draw somebody and it's the Lord doing all the work. And then at the same time, they'll say, oh, you easy believism guys going out preaching the gospel. No one's going to get saved that way. Well, if it's the Lord's work right then he's doing it what what's the big deal about us preaching the gospel just clear clear presentation of the gospel and so there's a little hypocrisy there but not only that what they teach is that uh to be saved involves uh part of that salvation is a total commitment to the lord and yet nobody is, is totally committed we all have sin we all fall short so there's some hypocrisy there and then last week i started a, a new section called the ignorance of the lordship salvation crowd and I don't even necessarily mean that in, a, in, a, in the sense of them being uh, just dumb. Some of them are just ignorant. They don't know. Probably not everybody is will, willfully ignorant and just, uh, just choosing to believe wrong, but they've been confused by a lot of false teaching out there. And it's real easy on some of these verses to get kind of confused. And so I'm trying not to just make fun of those people. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm going to make fun of them. <laughs> but that's, I'm not trying to... Uh, poke fun. That's not the intent of this message. But there are some things that are thrown at us, and and the the name that is called easy believism, and they say, oh, you guys, uh, somebody just recently said you're making people twofold the child of hell for preaching a clear presentation of the gospel. I just don't get it. And so with that, and a lot of other people, uh, some questions were asked, and the topic of lordship salvation came up. Uh, I started going through this, and if you hadn't already heard. Uh, I've been reading through this article that you find online from gotquestions.org called What is Lordship Salvation? And in that, the reason I chose that is because he took a lot of big Lordship Salvation guys like John MacArthur and such and took out stuff from their books and what they teach. And I think he's on the same page with them. And he just was breaking this down. And so I don't want to go back and read all of this, uh, but in the kind of introduc introduction... Uh, there was a ton of scriptures. I tried to go through some of those, and some of those scriptures are going to be brought up again in this section. Uh, but then at the end of that, he said, here are nine teachings that set lordship salvation apart from easy believism. So what he's saying is, here's why lordship salvation is right and easy believism is wrong. Now, I've tried to point this out, and I probably will every time I preach from this series, but there's a little bit of truth in all false doctrines. And so that's the problem. That's going to be the biggest problem is deciding, you know, what they're claiming is easy believism. Some of it, I agree, that would be wrong. We don't teach that, you know. Some of those things, and I'll point out here in a little bit, uh, I would agree that's false. We don't, we don't, that's why we don't do it that way. But then on the other hand, there are some things that they say and that they would define as lordship salvation that I would say, well, I agree with that. Because there's a little bit of truth in all false doctrines. But as a whole, what they're saying, and there's a lot of flip-flop, and there's a lot of confusion uh, in what they're teaching. And so this is what I wanted to make sure to explain. And the best way to do that is to get all these verses that they're throwing out as their proof text and to look those up in the Bible for ourselves and go through them. Obviously, I can't do a textual sermon on each one of these verses, but we can kind of point to them and see the ignorance and so last week I talked about the ignorance of the uh, repentance doctrine. What they say, repent of your sins for salvation. Clearly taught with uh, practically all Lordship Salvation preachers. And so now we're going to move on. Hopefully I can cover two more tonight. Number one, I mean, number two would be the ignorance about the new creation. Ignorance about the new creation. So let me read to you what he's got here in this paragraph. And then we'll look at some of the verses that he uses. He says, A Christian is a, new, uh, is a new creation and cannot just stop believing and lose salvation. 
Now look, I, I would say that's probably true. For the most part, I have that belief. If somebody truly believes in the Lord and has truly been saved, they're probably not going to just fall into unbelief. I'm not saying it couldn't happen. Uh, people could doubt their salvation. They, they could begin to question some things. But I just feel like if the Holy Ghost is in there, they're not going to stop believing, all right? But look, there's some room for, there's some wiggle room in there because there's some good verses uh, that we could pull up in the Bible saying, look, even if somebody stopped believing uh, or claimed to stop believing or whatever it is, uh, you know, the fact that they put their faith in Christ at some point, it, 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 you, you can't, we know you can't lose your salvation. And so I don't know what was causing them to think that they stopped believing. You know, that's, to, that's for God to tell. Okay, so, uh, so we just go off of the moment of their salvation. Obviously, uh, we can't see the heart, so there's a little bit of judging we do sometimes based on the fruit. But look, we don't, we don't count that, those works as part of their salvation. Right. And so, uh, and so there, there's, like I said, there's a lot of back and forth. There's going to be a few phrases that sound good, but you have to listen to everything they say. So he says, the object of faith, the object of, no, I'm sorry, that's the wrong verse. Uh, the Christian is a new, is a new cre creation and cannot just stop believing and lose salvation. I'm not quite sure why I even brought that up as opposed to easy believism. But then he says this, faith itself is a gift of God. And he quotes Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. I'll, I will get there in a minute. And real faith endures forever. And he quotes Philippians 1, 6. Salvation is all God's work, not man's. Those who believe in Christ as Lord are saved apart from any effort of their own. So let me break that down a little bit, okay? First of all, he says, faith is the gift of God. We believe it's the gift of God, but I don't think that means what you think that means, right? When he's using that, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. You're familiar with this passage. I'm sure pretty much everybody quotes that when they're giving the gospel, leading somebody to the Lord, that salvation is a free gift. And so here's what he quotes, or here's what he references, Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. It says, And you hath he quickened. Okay, that means to, to be made alive. Somebody who was not alive, now he's made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sin. Okay, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. So we understand what he's saying here. Uh, you were dead because you sinned. And now he's quickened you. He's talking to believers. He's saying he, you have, he quickened who were dead in trespasses of sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. Okay, naturally, that's what we did. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved." Now, he stops right there, and then he skips down to verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And he takes that to say that God just imparted that gift to you, and he's coming from a Calvinist uh, standpoint saying that, you know, uh, you didn't really have a choice. God just imparted this gift to you. But I want to say he's missing some things in here. Number one, I, I think it's interesting. Why would he leave out verse 6 and 7? Let's look at verse 6 and 7. Okay, so he says, uh, by grace ye are saved. Now, I'm only looking at a King James, and I realize that he doesn't use King James, but I think that's pretty evident. You're saved by grace. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his uh, grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now, he left that part out, and I can only figure that the reason that you'd leave that out is because uh, what is leading somebody to believe is that the minute we are saved, we're sitting together in heavenly, in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. There's no works. There's no nothing. You know, uh, that person, as soon as they got saved and they were quickened, 
they're seated together, right, in heavenly places. And then it says, in a later date, at a later time, then all that righteousness in Christ will be revealed. I believe that. I believe that one day we'll stand before the Lord perfect, not because of our own works, but through the righteousness of Christ, Amen. which will be revealed. And so why would he skip that? And then not only that, why would you go to verse 8 and skip verse 9? Because verse 9 says this, Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now they would claim, no, we don't believe in a works-based salvation, but if you're saved, you'll do the works. Okay? But why would he say, why would he leave that verse out? The only thing I can think is somebody might uh, want to boast a little bit about their righteousness. <laughs> All right? Excuse me. Somebody might want to boast a little bit about their righteousness. And here's the funny thing about it. They'll often say, a Calvinist will say that, that if you don't believe in Calvinism, then what you're wanting is, is to, to get credit for your salvation. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, they'll say that you're wanting credit, and so that's why you're refusing that it's all the work of God. You want some of that credit for yourself. Well, that's not true. I don't take any credit, like I've said before. Uh, any more than holding on to a life preserver whenever I'm drowning, whenever I get, when I get pulled out of the water, I'm not going to say, did you see how wonderful I was holding on to that life preserver? <laughs> that's silly, right? And so as much as me dying of thirst and somebody said, here, have some water. I say, man, did you see how I drank that water? I'm not going to brag about that. And so uh, it's kind of ridiculous that they would say that. But here at the same time, if you think about it, there's a lot of boasting involved. Yeah. Because they're telling you, well, if you really got saved, here's what they're saying, you'll look like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you really got saved, you'll repent like I did. You'll cry like I did. You'll do the works like I'm doing the works. And that's hypocrisy, as we pointed out before. And it's right. also uh, uh, just a total misunderstanding of what the gift of God is. Because what the gift of God, what it's saying about, what, it, what it's saying by gift of God isn't like God just automatically imparted something to you in a way that wouldn't even be a gift. Or yeah, a gift is something that is offered to you and you have to receive that gift, right? If he just kind of implanted it in somebody without their own choice, uh, that's not even really just a gift. I mean, it's kind, of it's kind of forced upon them, okay? And so he's not doing that. He's giving a gift. And so they're making that gift of God mean something uh, totally different. Okay, no, uh, B, well, you don't know what number I'm on. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about ignorance about the new creation, okay? And so he also says this. He says that real faith endures forever. And he quotes Philippians 1.6 on that. Let's go there. Philippians 1.6. He's saying real faith will produce works. Or I'm sorry, real faith will endure forever. And so here's what the Bible says in uh, Philippians. He's talking, he's introducing, this is the, the introductory part of it. And he's saying who he's writing to. I thank God upon every remembrance of you. And then he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of of Jesus Christ. You ever had somebody pull that on you and say, look, if you're saved, you're just going to endure unto the end. It's called the preservation of the saints, and you're just going to do the work. You've heard that? Okay. If they had a King James Bible, though, they wouldn't be confused on what the word you means. Who's he talking to? Let's go back. This is Paul and Timotheus, uh, the, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. He's writing to a church. And he's saying you, which is plural. If it was singular, he would have said thou. Right. But he's talking to a church. And he's saying, you know, he that has begun a good work in this church will be faithful unto the end. You mean to tell me that everybody who was part of uh, you know, those who are seated together in heavenly places, uh, everyone who ever would be ca that came to Christ w never fell away, you know, never, never had their moments of falling into sin and all that kind of stuff. Of course they did. Okay, but Jesus said uh, I, and, and Matthew 16, 18, he's talking to Peter and he's getting ready to go up to the Father. He says, I say unto, uh, also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church 
And that rock was what Peter had said, thou art the Christ. And he says, upon that rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is saying, look, I will build my church. And I began a good work in you, I'll complete it. Right? And so he's saying that he has, uh, he's provided everything that we need as a church. I mean, I'm taking some application here for ourselves. But I've completed, I've, I've given you everything you need as a church. And if you're following me and, you're, and as, a, as a church, you're moving on with what I equipped you with, I'll be faithful to, uh, to complete that in you. But along the lines, individually, aren't some people going to fall? Are we just going to assume, oh, they just weren't saved because they, they left and went to another church or they, they stopped doing the original works that they were called to do? That's not what he's saying. He's just saying that, that, whole, that the whole church will, uh, will endure. Let me read it again. He says, he that has begun a good work in you, plural, will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Okay, he's built his church. Gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so uh, let's go to the next part. He says this. He says, uh, and they're saved apart from any effort of their own. Let me read that whole paragraph again, actually. Uh, he says, faith itself is a gift of God, and real faith endures forever. Salvation is all God's work, not man's. Those who believe in Christ as Lord are saved apart from any effort of their own. And then he goes to Titus 3.5. Let's go there. Titus 3.5. All right. Titus 3.5. He says... Um, for unto, no, that's Hebrew, sorry, what did I do here? Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Amen. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And so first of all, right off the bat, when he says, we're saved apart from any effort of our own, I say amen. In fact, I say we actually believe that more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> we believe it's all Jesus Christ. We put our faith in what he did and that and then we are saved, not by anything that we do of our own, but but what what he did and we put our faith in that. But what he's saying here is he's getting hung up I believe on this regeneration. Okay, he's saying he saved you by the washing of regeneration. There's this new being uh you're you're just this new person that's been saved. Well, here's what washed by regeneration means. Think about re Regenerate, right? What's that? What, what does that make you think about? Born again. Regenerate. We are born again. And Jesus made it very clear to Nicodemus, what must a man be, do to be born again? He says, for whosoever believeth in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You want to be reborn again? You want to be regenerated? Look, it's not just some magical thing that God just does and you have no part of it. It's not something that uh, you're going to just entirely turn over to him and, uh, and everything about you is going to change. What changes is on the inside, which I'll get to in a minute. But, you, but that happens because you believed, right? Now, I know it goes deeper than just an, a knowledge and understanding of what the Bible says or some creed or something like that. It goes deeper than that. You actually put your faith in that and said, that is true. I'm trusting in what Jesus did to get me to heaven. Uh, and, and not by my own works, but he's saying the washing of regeneration. And then guess what else he says? And the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay, here's the thing. Uh, we, once we sin, you know, and all have sinned, the Bible says, once we sin, our, that spirit in us is dead. All right. And so uh, there is no spirit is dead. And so what, what he says there is that once we put our faith in him, he grants us the Holy Spirit. And the cool thing about the Holy Spirit is at that point we're sealed until the day of redemption. It's, again, no work of our own, not, nothing to do with the works that we do. None of that is part of salvation, okay? But it's just the regeneration uh, from trusting in Jesus and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. All right, so, so I believe that they have an, uh, an ignorance about what that new creation is. Okay, and, and you're going to see here 
There's three times. This is why I had Brother Justin read uh, 2 Corinthians 5 at the beginning, because there's three times in this article that he uses 2 Corinthians 5. Okay, and we're going to go to that here in a second. Uh, but let me uh, get, go into the next part, because these go hand in hand. But it, not only are they ignorant about what that new creation is. Again, the new creation is, doesn't mean that you're just this completely new body. Guess what? If, if, if God changed our bodies to where we now are, are not going to sin or whatever, you know, then these bodies, that would mean that there's a way that we can save these bodies and these bodies can live forever. But these bodies are corrupt. Okay, the new creation, the new creature is inside of us. It's one that never, look, there, it, it's not going to sin. It's not going to sin. It's completely covered in, you know, by the work that Jesus Christ did, sealed, into the Holy, uh, sealed by the Holy Ghost. The, new, the inner man doesn't sin. What sins is this outer man, this flesh. And Paul talks about this battle between the flesh and the spirit. Our spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right. And the flesh is always going to tend towards sin. That's why this flesh has to die. And we need to be given a glorified body. The body is just a shell, but it's got to be a glorified body that goes with our spirit that is made perfect in Jesus Christ. And so uh, so it's it's a it's a fallacy to believe that there's a new creature like uh, and, and I'll get there in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. But they go to this verse that says, uh, if any man is is uh, in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things have become new. Well, look, when you got saved, did everything become new? Not at all. Well, maybe you're not saved. <laughs> I guarantee it didn't, that's not the case for any man. And I don't care who's up there uh, self-righteously saying, hey, you got to look like me or else you didn't really get saved. Look, there's parts about you that, you know, whoever the most seemingly righteous person, there's stuff about them that did not change. There's certain sins that they still held on to. There are certain things they didn't repent of. There are certain things that they uh, still have a desire for. They'll say, oh, well, you won't have a desire to sin. You liar, you got a desire to sin. <laughs> that's natural. That's the body. That's the flesh. Okay, so it's the spirit that's made new. Okay, but then they also have an ignorance about what it means to have faith in Christ. Faith in Christ, he says, uh, it's faith in Christ himself and not a promise, a prayer, or a creed. Well, does anybody just have faith in a prayer? Like I said, a magical prayer. I mean, it's kind of like what I crossed myself. And so I'm thinking I'm going to heaven. Is any, does anyone here teach that? <laughs> Is anybody who's, who's accused of being easy believism ever teach that? There's just some magical prayer. I suppose there's people out there that do that. Hey, if you just say this exact word, these, these it's nobody's ex, ex, uh, uh, believing in a prayer. And he points to John 3, 16 in this and said, it's belief, faith is in Christ himself, right? But here's what Jesus said uh, for, he said, uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave, there's a gift, free gift of salvation. I mean, you, that's over and over in the Bible, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so they say, oh, see, well, you're believing in him. You're not believing in a, a prayer or some kind of creed or something like that. I'm like, who said we were? <laughs> it's almost so ridiculous, I don't even want to talk about it. But you could say, to some degree, we are trusting in a promise. I did believe in that promise, because he said, if you will put your faith in me and trust in me for your salvation and not your own works, then you can go to heaven, you know? And if I, if I stood before God and, uh, and, he try, and he told me anything differently, I would say, but, but Jesus promised, <laughs> right? Because that's his promise. That's what I'm trusting in, his promise, that it's all him and not us. And, uh, and that's what he said. So, so in a manner of speaking, we're trusting in a promise. And I would say, in a manner of speaking, for many years, I was trusting in a prayer, not so much that I said some kind of magical prayer that's going to get me to heaven. I knew better than that. But it was this prayer that said, Lord, I believe in you. You know, save me. I don't want to go to hell. And I just trusted that he heard that prayer and he answered that prayer. And I just trusted that. So does that mean I'm not saved? No, I realized that my faith was in Christ. Okay. But they're, they're, they're just kind of oversimplifying that, kind of creating a straw man argument and saying, you know, you can't put your faith in a promise or a prayer. Well, nobody said, I mean, 
I mean, good grief. Do we ever just kind of lead somebody, hey, hey, do you want to be saved? Say this prayer. I hope nobody in here does that. <laughs> if you were witness, if you're soul winning with somebody and they do that, come tell me, all right? We'll put a stop to it. Faith in Christ, uh, it's, in, it's faith in Christ himself, not a promise, prayer, or creed, okay? I understand that, but I think that uh, they're, they're kind of misunderstanding something. Okay, and then, it's, he, then he says this. He says, faith must involve a personal commitment. Faith must involve a personal commitment. Okay, so I've heard the illustration. I've even used it myself. Okay, faith is more than believing somebody can. You've heard the illustration, tightrope across the Grand Canyon, right? But faith is actually like getting in the barrel and letting him push you across the Grand Canyon. You ever heard that? Well, look, our faith is that when I die, you know, Jesus Christ is the one that's going to that's going to get me to heaven. <laughs> you know, what he did by me putting my faith in him, that's what's going to get me to heaven. It's not putting my faith in any kind of works that I'm doing. And that's what they're trying to say. Well, you can't just believe that Jesus can save. You've got to, you know, demonstrate that. You've got to have a total commitment. But again, who has ever had a total commitment? Nobody's ever told. Did they leave like everything behind them and just follow Christ, give up houses and land and, 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 and you know, any kind of a luxury or whatever and just follow? No, no one has a total commitment. We have our moments of being selfish. We have our moments of wanting things for ourselves. You know, nobody is saved by the amount of commitment. And so the interesting thing is, again, this is the second time. And then uh, next week, there's another time where he uses 2 Corinthians 5. So let's go there. 2 Corinthians 5. I don't know how well you followed along. I know he, uh, uh, Brother uh, Justin already read this, but I'm just going to pull out some parts of it here. But this is the claim that's made by the Lordship Salvation crowd that Faith must involve a personal commitment. For, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 15 is what he uses, but uh, well, let me just read that because this is the one he, he's pointing to. 5 verse 15, it says, In that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Okay, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? He died that we should live unto him and not for ourselves. Okay, that's a, that's a commitment. <laughs> that's a total commitment to the Lord. I don't see that. In fact, I think what they're doing is they're missing the context of the whole verse. Let's back up to verse 12. Verse 12 says, Okay, the, who, who's talking here? This is Paul and those guys who are with him, right? The apostles and, and those uh, laborers with him, fellow laborers. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have some, uh, somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, it causes us, because of our love for Christ, we can't help but do what we're doing. And what is that? Because we thus judge. Now, who's judging? Is this the Lord judging? No. no. This is Paul and whoever is working with him, and they're judging. What are they judging? That if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he rose for all, and that they which live for him should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now look, I agree. We should live for the Lord. Amen. When I knock on a door and somebody gets saved, I say, you should get baptized. You should start coming to church. You should read your Bible. <laughs> Well, why should I? Well, don't you love Christ who just saved your, your soul for all eternity? Don't you want rewards in heaven? Don't you want a victorious life on this earth? Don't you want all these things? Amen. You should live for the Lord. Amen. That's a total commitment. Well, not the salvation part. You see, salvation was, you said it yourself, Mr. Whoever, I forget his name. 
You said it yourself. My faith is in Christ. Okay? If your faith is in Christ, He's the foundation. Everything else is being built upon that foundation. And I agree. You should build upon that foundation. You should follow Christ. You should give as much as you can to Him. But that's not part of your salvation. So, uh, so here it says... Uh, uh, that you should, and I, there's a lot more I want to pull out in this passage, but I think that'll be next week that we get to that. All right, so here's another quote. He says, it is, uh, let me read the exact quote here. Uh, let me see. It is more than being convinced of the truth of the gospel. It is a forsaking of this world and a following of the master. And here's the next verse he's going to go to, John 10, 27. For the Lord Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. Not King James, I know. I know them and they follow me. Look at John chapter 10. I like this verse. I like to use this verse. John chapter 10, verse 27. But before I explain how we apply that verse to ourselves, which I think is totally fine for us to apply it to ourselves, we need to know what the context is, who is Jesus talking to, and if you think about it, who he's talking to is he's talking to about, at least, false prophets. He's talking about these Pharisees that are there, and he's saying, you know, uh, that uh, you would receive me, you would, un you would know my voice if you were my sheep. He says, but look, if you're not my sheep, you don't know my voice. And so, uh, uh, so let's look at that verse again. He says, uh, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. It's interesting. Uh, in Matthew uh, 7, he says, many will come to me. And I don't know where the other references are, but I know Matthew 7 it says, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. Right. I've done this in your name. I've done that in your name. I've done many wonderful works. And I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Right. You weren't my sheep. How did you become my sheep? Many wonderful works. No, because those are the guys that are, he's saying, I didn't I never knew you. They're trusting in their works. But he's saying, here's how I know you. Did you put your belief on me? Were you born again? Were you regenerated? If you experienced the new birth. Right. Then I know you has nothing to do with your wonderful works. A lot of false prophets do wonderful works. A lot of wicked people out there can show themselves as ministers of light, and they can appear as somebody who's holy and righteous and just. That doesn't mean anything in the eyes of God. God wants to know, did you, did you trust in Jesus? Did you call upon the Lord to save you? And, uh, and then that would be the sheep. But not only that... We can apply it to ourselves. I think it's a great verse concerning eternal security. I also have heard it put this way, and I think this is a good quote. I mean, I remember my, uh, uh, my wife's grandpa, Brother A.F. Collins, used, he, he said it this way. He said, um, it probably wasn't original with him, but he said, We aren't sheep because we follow the Savior. We follow the shape, Savior because we're sheep. Now, you could take that too far and say, oh, what is it? What, you know, you could almost make that lordship salvation. But look, we follow him as Christians because we're his sheep. But if anybody knows anything about sheep, sheep don't always follow the shepherd. <laughs> they might recognize him when he says, well, I don't know how they call sheep, but when he says, it's time for dinner, all the sheep come running. I know my shepherd, <laughs> right? Whenever he says, uh, hey, it's, and whenever it starts raining, they know where to go. I got to go to my shepherd. When uh, the wolves come to attack, they're looking for that shepherd. They know who it is who protects them. They know who their savior is. But look, every dumb sheep wanders off sometimes. And they start playing in the thorns and the thistles. And they get caught. And the wolves come and try to attack them. And then the, and then, and then the savior has to bail them out. You know, there's a lot of Christians who do not live for the Lord. They live in sin. They fall into selfishness. They, they do all these. They're, they're destroying their life, destroying their testimony, but they're still saved. They're still saved, even though they're sheep. They're just dumb sheep. <laughs> they're sheep that are getting lost, and he has to go find them again, and he got to bring them back, right? Just like he did, by the way, with the Jews. That's what that context is talking about. He's, he, Jesus is on the scene. And he's looking for those lost sheep. 
Okay, those, those, uh, uh, those Jews, the whole ministry started there, particularly with the Jews. It doesn't mean Gentiles couldn't be saved, but he's saying that's who he was going after because these are the ones who had followed all the Old Testament law and were supposed to be looking for the Messiah to come. Now the Messiah is here and he's saying, hey, let me gather up my sheep. Okay, and there's some people that weren't part of his sheep and there were some wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so he's saying, look, my sheep, they, know, they, they hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. But he's not saying it's a total commitment. Like everywhere I go, they go. Like they never stop following me. They never, that we, that's not the context at all. Okay. So let me just close. Okay. We got to start, stop a little bit short here. Let me close and give you just a few points in conclusion. All right. Number one. The new creation is something that happens in the spirit when we accept Christ. This flesh is still sinful flesh. You know, the wrinkles didn't go away when I got saved. Uh, the pimples and all the imperfections, they didn't go away when I got saved. All the change was done in the spirit. Now, this flesh and that spirit, until the day I die, are going to wrestle against each other. And the flesh is going to win a whole lot of times. Because that's what, that's what we have to purpose. We have to be diligent. We have to work really super hard to deny the flesh and walk in the Spirit. And the Bible makes it clear. You know, why does a preacher have to say, you got to walk in the Spirit? you got to remember that you're saved. you got to remember uh, that you're a child of God and you're not, you're not a child of the devil. You're not supposed to be doing those things. Why do preachers even have to preach that if it just naturally happens whenever a person trusts Christ? Because it doesn't naturally happen. It's hard, hard work to follow the Savior. There's a big difference between being saved and being a disciple of Christ. Multitudes and multitudes of people in the Bible got saved. I think there's clear evidence for that. But they didn't all follow Christ. Okay, the ones that followed Christ, he said, if you, if you follow me and then you turn back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. He didn't say you're not saved. <laughs> he didn't say, he said, you're not fit to be my disciple. You're not fit to do what I, if you, you, he says, I don't even have a place to lay my head. Now, how many of these Lordship Salvation guys have a place to lay their head? <laughs> right? Are you going to apply that scripture to you? No, here's what he's saying. He's saying, following me and being a disciple and taking up your cross and following me and bearing the burdens is hard, hard work. Are you sure you're cut out for it? And uh, he gathered up some guys and he gathered up a, a handful of people, you know, the, the 10 lepers that he healed. One of them followed. I don't know if he, I don't know how much he followed, but I'm saying one of them came back and gave him thanks. The rest of them just went on their merry way and said, woohoo, I'm saved. Because that's the natural t tendency to say, I got, I got saved, you know, but I still want this flesh. You say, well, it shouldn't be that way. I agree. It shouldn't be that way. That's what Paul was telling the Corinthians. You shouldn't do that. You should walk in the Lord and, and walk in the Spirit. So first of all, the new creation is something that happens in our spirit when we accept Christ. Number two, faith in Christ. That's such a hard concept, right? Well, how much faith can I have? Well, the Bible uses measurements like the size of a mustard seed. The Bible says, well, you know, yes, I believe. Lord, help thou mine unbelief. The Bible doesn't say you've got to have full commitment. You've got to believe 100% entirely, understand the Bible, know exactly what you're supposed to do. No, no, we're just choosing. It's a willful decision to follow Christ. I don't mean follow him and, and completely do everything. It's a willful decision to say, hey, I can't get to heaven on my own. I need what Jesus did for me to pay my, uh, to pay my price. So uh, it's a willful receiving of the free gift of salvation. The Bible makes it so clear. Uh, you can't, look, some people will say, well, you just teach a cheap grace, you know. It's just free. It's just cheap, you know. No, free doesn't mean cheap. <laughs> free, it was free to us. It cost the Lord a great price, okay. And, uh, and that doesn't cheapen what he did for us. It's just that it's free. Now, if we receive that and make a mockery of it, and, it's, and I think it was here in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, yeah, you shouldn't believe it. And then he talks about believing in vain, right? You shouldn't just believe that and then just not show, not show the works of that. Uh, I'm getting off on that. I'm, I'm going to distract you. You're going to go looking for it. <laughs> That'll come up in the next, week, next week's uh, lesson. Okay, number three. 
So the new creation, faith in Christ. Number three, even though our flesh might not win over sin, the flesh, uh, the flesh, this flesh will perish, but our spirit is sealed by God. This flesh can get in all sorts of trouble, cause us to do all kinds of terrible things. Spirit is still saved. The Bible makes that very clear. You can't lose that. It's, uh, it's sealed until the day of redemption. Number four, because He saved us and has given us everything we need to live a victorious life. Look, He didn't just save our soul. That's, yes, as far as salvation goes, He paid that price on the cross. We understand that. But He didn't just save your soul. He equipped His church and every individual. He equips you with everything you need. You want it? Ask for it. You lack wisdom? Ask for it. He's, give, he's made everything available, okay? And so if you want the victorious life, then look at this. You should live for Him and do all that you can to please Him. You should. That doesn't mean you naturally will when you get saved, but you should. And that's why we preach against sin. That's why we preach good works. That's why we preach that you ought to be soul winning. That's why we preach you ought to go to church, read your Bible, do all those kinds of things. Because it just makes sense that if He saved you, uh, that you would do that. And I didn't get to that part in Ephesians chapter 2, but it also says in verse 10, which He left out of this, I'll give Him, I'll give him another one. It says that you are the, His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Oh, see, there you go. i got to be able to do all the works because Jesus saved me. That's not what He's saying. But you should, if you want to bring honor and glory to Him. Look, there's a lot of vessels out there that are not glorious vessels. Yep. All right, Praise the Lord in heaven, glorified body, and, uh, and, and, and you know all things are, are made new in that way. But look, on this earth, there are some people that are very displeasing to the Lord. Some people who are ashamed kind of make a mockery out of, out of Christ. They call themselves Christians and live wicked lives and all that. That's terrible, okay? But I'm not going to say, look, if you're going to do that, well, then you're not saved. Well, you can say that, but that doesn't make it true. Because <laughs> the Bible says that our salvation is based on faith in what Jesus Christ did for us, okay? So I uh, just preached a message uh, last night in Iola. Faith, uh, I mean, it's, uh, knowledge is power, okay? We need to know I say, oh, no, you can't just believe in what Jesus did. You can't just have a knowledge of the facts of what Jesus did. That's true. But we need to know what he did. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then once we know that, then we can make a willful decision to accept Christ. Now, what that does after we accept Christ to our body, you know, that's up to us. You can live for him or you can choose to disobey and receive the chastening hand of correction, you know, or lose all your rewards. We we're just talking about that earlier. When we stand before the uh, Jesus on the judgment day, if you're saved, look, you're not going to be held accountable for every bad thing that you've done, but you're going to lose all your rewards if you've if it's all been in vain, or you just did it for yourself, or you did some good work and then you bragged and boasted about it. He said you're going to lose those rewards, and we're going to kind of be somewhat empty-handed at that point, but we still saved. A lot of verses I could show you about that, but I think you get it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for our salvation. Help us not to confuse people on this matter and help all those uh, who are teaching falsely on this and leading people to believe that works is a part of their salvation. Lord, help us correct that. Help them correct that and help us preach Christ. And to not know anything among uh, other people except Jesus Christ crucified. And help us uh, to preach that gospel and not try to coerce people into doing things uh, as part of their salvation. At which time they wouldn't be saved and they, would, and they would still be destined to hell. Lord, help us make it a very clear and simple gospel as you created. And not to frustrate the grace of God. Help us to just uh, uh, preach what Jesus has done and this free gift of salvation that we, we could never earn salvation on our own, but Jesus died for us and he was buried and he rose again, did it all for us, Lord. Help us make that gospel clear and, uh, and if possible, Lord, just uh, uh, put a stop to those people that are teaching contrary. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.